Hey everyone, this is Jenna Talbot from Whiteboard Advisors. We're gonna give everyone 30 to 60 seconds or so to, to join us, but really excited to get started in just a minute. Great, I'm seeing everyone joining us. There is a lot, a lot of enthusiasm for this topic. So excited to have everyone today. All right, well, we are filling up quickly, so I will get us started. I know we have lots we wanna to cover today. Uh, I'm Jenna Talbot. I lead the communications practice here at Whiteboard Advisors. Uh, thank you for joining us. This is part of an ongoing series that we really kicked off at the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, bringing some of our friends from the media together to talk about what's happening. As we were all getting ready uh, to join you all live, we were just talking about how uh, incredible it's been over the last two years to have education be kind of the breaking news beat, uh, which hasn't always been the case in our wonderful uh, field of work. I'm so very excited. Earlier in the uh, last fall, we did a conversation with higher ed reporters. Today, we're going to focus on K-12. We've got a great uh, breadth of, of experience represented on the screen here today. Uh, a range of trade, local, national, print, radio, online. Um, so really excited to have the conversation. Uh, this will be on the record. I know we have some reporters joining us in the audience, um, so we will be on the record. If you have questions, feel free to follow up uh, with any of our panelists uh, directly. And with that, I'll pass it over to Thomas Rogers, who leads our K-12 practice here at Whiteboard. He'll be leading the conversation. Thomas, thanks so much. I'll let you hands, I'll hand over the reins and let you introduce our wonderful panelists. Thanks, Jenna, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, would love to start out with an around the horn. Um, the big question we're here to answer today, or attempt to answer, is what's next for K-12 education and journalism? Um, so let's start um, with, we'll start with Lori um, and have her introduce herself and her outlet and tell us what she thinks is the biggest trend shaping K-12 education journalism today and why. Sure. Hi. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, my name is Lori Higgins. I'm the Bureau Chief for Chalkbeat Detroit. Uh, we're a nonprofit uh, news organization covering uh, the story of education um, in eight cities. Uh, we also have a national bureau. Um, I, I, I was thinking about this question, and, and I, I couldn't decide what, I, what was the, like the biggest trend. I mean, I think one trend that we're seeing is just kind of an explosion in independent education journalism, um, like Chalkbeat. Um, I, I think, you know, I've been an education reporter for a long time and I've seen traditional media, um, uh, uh, you know, de-emphasize education. Um, but I think, you know, as, as Jenna was saying earlier, like we're seeing, you know, greater interest in education, um, but we're also seeing the expansion and the inclusion of more independent um, news organizations uh, that are covering this, this really important topic. Christina? Sure. Um, so uh, my name is Christina Samuels, and I am a senior editor and a reporter with the Heckinger Report. We focus on um, education innovation and inequality, and we partner with uh, publications all over the country um, to publish our work. Um, there's so much <laughs> that's going on. I mean, it's almost overwhelming sometimes to think about what's happening in the education field right now, but I think that um, one of the biggest trends, a couple of the biggest trends that I think that are facing K-12 journalism right now is obviously a question about learning loss. There is, you know, a debate about what exactly to call what has happened with students over the last couple of years. Learning loss is a term that some people do not like, but just for, just for the sake of this discussion, we'll say what is happening with children's learning and what we do to recover um, and what can be done is a huge story um, to be covered uh, probably for the next several years. And the second thing that I think that's standing out for us right now is political polarization and how that is affecting um, the education field right now. A lot of um, schools had, had maybe not been insulated from uh, politics. I think that would be overstating it, but perhaps we had not been sort of at the tip of the spear for some of the really angry stuff that you are seeing 
uh, right now. And that's a story that will, you know, certainly deserve coverage for a while. Definitely. Corey? I was kind of hoping you were going to call on Aaliyah because I what? still don't have my thoughts together. Um, I'm just going to brain barf here. Uh, because honestly, I don't know uh, if the covering education in the pandemic has taught me anything. It's that I don't know. Um, and I'm glad, Christina, that you mentioned learning loss um, so that I don't have to be the first person to use those two words in combination. Because uh, as everyone in this panel knows, um, those words stir a lot of heat. And, and I think rightfully so. At the same time, gosh, we really need to talk about the effect that the pandemic had on kids in so many ways, but including academically. And I and I'll just I'll just hone in on that a little bit more and say I, I think one of the things that's going to be driving our coverage at NPR, as it has over the last two years, um, is the focus on equity um, in and, and the sort of disparate outcomes from the pandemic and how we've seen um, students in high, high poverty districts and wealthier districts outcomes sort of diverge and, and maybe expanding disparities that have always been there. And, and then like, what can we actually do about it with money? because I think the only other thing we can all agree on right now is that schools do have money. And I think we'll get a little bit more into the money that schools have and how it's flowing, um, because I know that's driven a lot of coverage. Um, but Aaliyah, let's hear from you. Uh, yeah, so I'm Aaliyah Wong. I cover education for USA Today, specifically inequities in education. Um, I think all education journalism is about inequities, but, but it's been really nice to have that um, as an explicit focus of what I cover. Um, and I, I agree with what everyone has said thus far. I think um, to piggyback on uh, off of something Christina was mentioning, I think, you know, one trend that's really going to um, shape a lot of the journalism now and moving forward is, is just widespread skepticism of and even antagonism towards the public education system. I think that's always been there, of course, um, but the context has changed and we've long been aware of statistics showing Americans real lack of confidence in the nation's public school system. You know, they may think their local public school is, is doing a good, good job when asked about the country school system as a whole, they're, they're prone to giving bad marks. Uh, and, you know, we've long, we education journalism, uh, journalists have long covered the rise of and, and tension surrounding charter schools as the antidote to traditional public schools. We've covered distrust of teachers unions. We've covered sort of ideological battles over the purpose of education. You know, is it, is it to promote gainful employment or is it to, to nurture children into uh, contributing citizens and, and good human beings? You know, those are perennial conversations but I think the pandemic has, has complicated and, and reinforced those um, tensions and it's added new layers. You know, whether you're writing a story about enrollment trends, you know, the dip in enrollment in public schools or opposition to CRT or the mask wars, you know, the skepticism, um, this antagonism really un underpins the conversation a lot of the time. And I don't think it's going away. Um, those tensions are continuing to mount and will continue to play out in all kinds of ways. So I think that will continue to fuel a broad range of, of angles and, and coverage on this beat. As we were talking about before, before we got started, education is now the in the news every, I guess, in the headlines every day um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, Lori, I'm going to start with you again. Uh, you've covered education in Detroit for, I think, almost two decades now, uh, first at Detroit Free Press and now at Chalkbeat Detroit. Um, what are the local stories you're watching in Detroit? And, and what stories do you expect to see national become national stories? And I think the reverse of that question is like, what national stories are becoming local stories for you? Lori, I think you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I think in Detroit, the the biggest thing I'm 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 watching is is how the school district, the main school district that educates about fifty thousand students, how they recover from the pandemic. Um, if, if you think about the Detroit district, they were under state control, some form of state control for 
a couple of decades um, in the, you know, from 1999 until up until 2016, they were just starting to get a little bit of momentum, um, you know, from 2017 onward. Um, you know, test scores were showing us a, a, a slight in improvement, uh, chronic absenteeism, which is huge in, in Detroit. Um, well over 70, well, well over 60% of the students in the district are chronically absent. Mm -hmm. uh, they were starting to see some positive, uh, you know, direction in, in, in so many of these things. And, and then the pandemic hit and they lost thousands of students. Um, the, quite, the question that the story I'm looking for is, is how and whether or not this district can recover from uh, the, the impact of the pandemic. Um, in, in Michigan, as in most states, uh, you know, state aid is based largely on enrollment. And if they are not able to recover students, uh, that could be devastating for the school district. Uh, you know, right now they have the cushion of the federal, uh, the COVID relief money, that money is going to go away at some point, and that cushion won't be there. And the political polarization of education, as, as you know, the folks before me have already talked about, um, you know, the, the question is, are law, would lawmakers be as willing today as they were back in 2016 to provide some relief for a district like Detroit? So that that's one thing I'm looking at. Um, you know, obviously most not obviously most maybe most people don't know this, but but half of the kids in the city actually do not attend the school district. They attend charter schools or they attend schools in surrounding uh, school districts or or um, you know private schools. Um, so I, I'm also looking at like what how the the district's recovery impacts you know all these other schools that are educating Detroit students. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, with attendance, I've heard from, from reporters across the country that sometimes the hardest part is like finding out where the students went. Um, and even the State Departments of Ed are, are scratching their head trying to answer that question. Have you, have you seen anyone doing that successfully? I mean, I don't, I don't think that anyone really has a magic pill for this. Um, I spent some time um, last spring following um, a couple of parent volunteers who were going door to door, you know, trying to find kids who had just not shown up or were not coming to school regularly. Um, so many of those door knocks went unanswered. Um, you know, there some some people did answer the door um, and it, you know, like it, we actually came across a kid who answered the door who said, Oh, I, I'm in class right now, but like, I'm not sure if he was really in class. <laughs> um, so I think it's, you know, like I said, no one really has found the magic, like chronic absenteeism existed well before the pandemic. Um, districts have been struggling for years to get kids in school who were not coming on a regular basis. It has just gotten worse because of the pandemic. Um, I think it, it honestly, it takes, like more than it takes multiple efforts to track down kids. And even then, you know, that may or may not be successful. And, and your point about going door to door brings me to our next question. And this is one for everyone. And I'll let, I'll let you guys decide who goes first. Um, how have you, how has the pandemic pushed you to rethink about how you're finding sources for stories? Um, you know, early days, I talked to a few folks that were like, I used to just kind of go to a school and if I needed, I was working on a story, particularly in the local sense, you weren't able to do that and find parents outside the school. How are you finding sources for your stories these days? Let's, uh, let whoever wants to jump in there, go for it. I, I mean, I can just jump in maybe just to say that it's been extraordinarily difficult. I, I mean, I hope, I, I hope maybe it's, that's just us. And I think that one of the challenges for a national publication, or at least, uh, you know, when we are working with freelancers, obviously we, we are trying to work with freelancers who are based in the communities that they're covering. But I am, you know, writing stories that are um, uh, local. And I mean, we joke that, um, you know, we can get like one call and you better ask all those questions. <laughs> So like in that one call, because then after that, you'll never get a call back or you'll never be able to hear from a person again. It's just challenging. And um, 
you know, I mean, it just, it, you know, there's, there's nothing to be done for it except to just keep, you know, trying. And then, you know, we, we are able to, one, one thing that is, you know, um, helpful is being able to sort of like tap social media. There's a lot of more like kind of ways that parents are connecting with one another. There, you know, I, I did a story recently in, uh, in Prince George's County, Maryland, which is a suburb of Washington, D.C., and I, was con I connected with parents through a Facebook group of an affinity group that I was, was looking for, and then, like, as soon as I got a parent, I was like, when can we meet? Because I got to get to like right now. And, you know, and, and, and true enough, a lot of those parents faded away, but I was able to hold on to enough of them to make the story. Um, you know, I don't know whether it's, it's the same for other folks, um, but, you know, that's, that's what we're finding on our end. And there's nothing to be done for it, but to just sort of work through it. Anyone else have things to add on that? Like okay, man. Oh, no, go ahead. Huh? <clears throat> Um, no, I completely agree. It's, it's been extraordinarily difficult. But I think, you know, all of us were, were national or many of us on this panel are national reporters. And in some ways, I don't, I think it just made me better at sourcing. You know, when, I, you know, when I was a local reporter, I'd rely a lot on sort of the boots on the ground experiences to source my stories. You know, you're at an event and you find someone to chime in. You're at your local school board meeting and you ask a few questions to the person who gave lots of testimony. You're, you're waiting outside of school to talk to parents and kids, um, you know, a good national reporter should try to do those things as much as possible. But in reality, and even when I was at the Atlantic pre-COVID, you know, I do a lot of my sourcing from the comfort of my cubicle in the Watergate, you know, lots of Googling, lots of Twitter and Reddit and Facebook and Instagram and now TikTok sleuthing, lots of like virtual networking. Um, so I think the pandemic has sort of forced me to get better at that, leveraging, like Christina was saying, groups, um, groups, and there have been a lot of groups that have formed of, of parents or, or other people who, who are just really, you know, have a lot of thoughts and want to share them. Um, I think, you know, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, restrictions made in-person reporting extremely difficult, and, um, you know, there, I think, I'm thinking of New York City as an example, it's been extremely tough to get into those classrooms to this day, like I was recently trying to, to get into a classroom um, in New York City, and, and still it's, it's incredibly hard, um, but, but one thing I've, I've learned from all this is, is just the importance of the parent voice. Um, I think it's it's become much more prominent in education reporting, and that's a good thing. You know, parents and caregivers invariably played um, a much bigger role in, in their kids' education, which were, were much more privy to, to what their kids were learning and the pedagogical process and the sort of internal and external politics of schoolhouses. So I find myself seeking uh, out those perspectives a lot more. Uh, I think that's an important lesson. And, you know, you also have to balance it with concerns that parents are, are having undue influence over curricula and, and um, in particular history and sex education. So it's a fine balance, but, but it's, it's forced me to get better at sourcing. I just want to throw one thing out there, um, seconding what Christina and Aaliyah said. I mean, I feel like when I'm sourcing a story, I have to make a lot more calls now than I used to. I feel like every call is like a Rube Goldberg machine, kicks off a thing that then kicks off a thing, and you hope the third person down the line actually helps you reach the person who's ultimately going to end up in the story. Um, but glass half full, I, I will say before the pandemic, I did um, I did a lot of traveling, um, but I, I, I generally laid the groundwork before the travel. So I had to basically source remotely, um, even for stories where I went local. Um, but, and I did all that over the phone. And, and, and now I use Zoom for all of my interviews. And I, I feel like my interviews have gotten better. Um, it's more intimate. Um, it's, I think it's also like f for ideally when I'm doing a story, I'm talking to people who've never spoken to a reporter before. And I, I find it much easier to set people at ease, to reassure them that like, I'm a normal person with Legos on my shelf and pictures on my wall. Um, and like I did, a, I still remember a really lovely interview I did with a, a mom and her son a year ago. And um, we just did it together. And, and it kind of threw off because I was like, you know, I'm going to ask you some questions. And then I just want to sort of be in the room. Can we just be in the room? And maybe I'll, I'll talk to your son for a while. and We'll make some jokes and he can show me some of his toys. 
And it was so much fun. And they were so relaxed because they were in their space and I was not in their space, but I was part of it. And so I, I, I don't want that to change. I feel like that's as, that has absolutely improved my journalism. Um, I'll just, should, oh, I'm sorry, Larry. It's okay, I'll, I'll just say, say this really quickly. Um, one thing I think is, is, I think we've all become better journalists. I think this has been such a challenge. And I think that, you know, sometimes you can become very comfortable in how you seek sources. And it's really forced us to sort of maybe go back to our roots and just figure out like new and different ways of finding people. Um, also, uh, I wanna um, echo what Corey just said about improving your interviewing, because I think that, you know, it has been difficult getting into classrooms. And so sometimes you still want to be able to create a moment or, or be able to provide some descriptive, you know, material in a story. And, and so it really like you, it forces you to maybe ask deeper questions, ask more descriptive questions of, of your um, interviewees. Um, so I think it, as challenging as this has been, I, I still think it's been overall, it's been a good thing for, for us as journalists. I um, I wish that I weren't adding like a, a worry at the end of this, but I, I will say one thing that I'm concerned about is that um, I think that how we are perceived is getting caught up in the political context that is happening right now. You know, back in 2016, I remember, you know, some of my friends asked me like if I was worried that like this kind of concern about the fake news would like affect, how, you know, what would affect like my own work. That was like, no, cause like, I'm just Christina, right? I'm just like, you know, I just cover schools. Nobody, <laughs> you know, I mean, people, it, it's, you know, sort of in the same way, like people may not like their you know schools writ large, but they like their own school. They may not like reporters writ large, but it's Christina, she's fine. Um, but I think that like, you know, kind of like, and I even remember the very beginning of the pandemic, you know, I just reached out to a school district and they were like, wow. You know, at that time I was at Education Week and I was like, Education Week reporter calling us, that's amazing. They would not be amazed now and they would not. And I think that there is like a kind of, um, especially when you're calling about things that like people don't necessarily want to talk about. No superintendent is going to jump on the phone and like, please ask me what I'm doing, what I think about critical race theory. Um, it's, it, it is challenging to like cold call people like that. So I worry about like, you know, sort of this knee jerk, um, like uh, I don't trust you, which when you are not close to them can just be, you know, the stonewalling can be quite easy because you just don't return the call. You just don't make the contacts. You just don't. And yet these will often, I don't want to, Hope, hopefully nobody in the audience is like this. These will be the same people who are like, why can't we ever get a right story told in the media? And I'm like, oh, if only you were working with me to do that. So anyway, I don't know. I, it, it, you know, I'm babbling because it's just, I, I have no great answer to it. But I mean, it's something that I think about all the time um, where I didn't really think about like how national politics was affecting how I am perceived. I do think that that is a real consideration now for me. You, um, Christina, you set me up nicely for the next question that I had. Um, one thing that we've all seen is um, with like local school board and state school board meetings since the pandemic, almost all of them are streamed to the internet some way so you see what's happening at this local level. Um, Aaliyah, earlier this year, you published a story on the political fights that are dominating school boards across the country. Um, last time I looked at our tracker, 42 states have introduced at the state level um, bills that are limiting divisive concepts from being taught in classrooms, whether that's critical race theory, um, teaching about sexuality and LGBTQ individuals. Um, how are you thinking about this, covering this issue as it continues? I don't think any of us expect it to, these issues to go away in the next, in the immediate or foreseeable future. Um, and then how do you think coverage of this issue is evolving? Yeah, speaking of things that superintendents aren't excited to get calls about, um, I think in the beginning, um, much of the news media, myself included, was, was very reactive to what was happening. We hear that there are, you know, that there's physical violence and, and vicious borderline extremists flooding school board meetings, and naturally the impulse is to, to fixate on that. 
Um, school board meetings used to be sleepy, stilted affairs. I remember, you know, when I was a local reporter having to attend school board meetings and desperately trying to eke out some semblance of an interesting story. Um, I do give us a lot of credit, however, for quickly pivoting to a more analytical stance, you know, looking at what's the context, um, who's dominating the headlines. We know it's a vocal minority. What is the impact on students' mental health, on their learning, on teachers, on teacher burnout, on, on a community's well-being? And what's the relationship between these down-ballot races and, and bigger picture politics? Um, at, at USA Today, you know, since the get-go of this phenomenon, we've been really collaborative you know, across teams involving politics reporters, investigative reporters, breaking news reporters, but also across the entire Gannett network. USA Today is the flagship of a massive uh, news media organization. Um, and I, I'm really grateful that Christy Thompson, who my beloved former editor who recently left um, for a cool gig at the AP, um, I really credit her with, with really bringing people together. And I think that interdisciplinary um, interregional collaboration has really enabled our reporting to advance the conversation rather than just kind of reductively um, react to the sensational aspects of the trend. Um, I think it's easy, but but perhaps irresponsible to, to cover this trend in, in broad strokes and that collaboration allows us to, to delve into the nuances. Um, as an example, in one recent story related to this issue, um, I looked at how um, books with LGBTQ plus characters account for, you know, disproportionate number of the, the books being targeted or altogether banned from schools and libraries. And I took it a step further and I, I scrutinized this common refrain that, that these books are pornographic or obscene. And I looked at the history of labeling queer media as obscene and, and including the legal history. And I looked at why queer books are more likely to contain sexual content, you know, and on, on the role of that content in helping queer kids and their allies understand sexual differences and identity. Um, so, so I think that's an example of how, you know, USA Today and, and many, you know, journalists on this panel and, and in the education beat have really sought to, to advance the conversation. Um, I was just reading a piece in, in the 74, and it was talking about, it was predicting basically a wave of, of federal um, CRT related legislation mirroring what we've seen at the state and local levels. Um, so, you know, that just underscores, this isn't just the flavor of the day. And that means it's incumbent on us journalists to think critically about new and constructive ways to cover this issue. You know, similar to the coverage of the pandemic school closures and learning loss. There are only so many stories we can write explaining what's happening. We have to sort of get past that and, and really analyze, um, you know, in a way that that will help people understand what's going on rather than just reinforce their, you know, ha have people question their answers, essentially. Anyone else have things to add? I I'm curious, Christina, you covered the South. The South is your area of focus with Hackinger mm -hmm. Report, where we're seeing some of these bands, most notably Florida and Georgia. Lori, you're, you're our local voice. Um, I don't know how this is playing out in Detroit. Then Corey, you're at the thing about the federal policy level. Um, I just wanna say, I'm glad Aaliyah is the one um, doing these deep dives because <laughs> I agree with everything that she said. Uh, and I just, I, 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 th I think the media in general, oh, I hate it when people say the media. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of reporters in general, part of this is just because of deadlines and pressure in the newsroom. Uh, a lot of reporters chase the shiny thing. Um, and by shiny, I mean conflict. It's loud, it's noisy, it's exciting. And I think that's dangerous. I just think it's dangerous. I think we are at a really tenuous moment in our history, in our culture, um, and we've got to behave responsibly as arbiters of truth and fact. And I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I mean, as, as Aaliyah said so well, I mean, I think that like the contextualizing, trying to like bring that larger piece. And you know what? I mean, I have some sympathy. I have a great deal of sympathy for, for local reporters having been one is like, you're doing a lot, a lot. I mean, I, I've done the, you know, late night school board meetings and, you know, the budget stories and the, you know, Dr. Seuss read across America stories and things like that. 
and then to be thrown into sort of like this maelstrom of like pandemic and you know remote and then all of a sudden like parents are showing up at school board meetings with like t matching t-shirts and you know getting dragged out literally dragged out uh, you know i mean there is um a lot to cover and i don't uh you know for as much as I can look at some individual story and say like, well, I would have done it differently. I don't know like what the pressures are, you know, of these, of, of these individual reporters are, but I mean, to the extent that we can, I mean, we've got to be able to try to tell like the bigger story here. These things are, you know, none of what we're seeing now is like happening in a vacuum, um, you know, to tell like this larger context. And sometimes it's, it, you know, I mean, I think that also one of the hardest things is like, sometimes the community is not really interested in hearing what it is that we have to say about any of this stuff. Um, so doing all that and kind of getting frozen out by sources is tough, it's tough. Um, you know, but I mean, I guess none of us went into this for it to be easy, but I mean, a lot of us didn't go into it to be like docs either. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rough time right now in some ways. I think the big danger from stories like this, um, which is why I found what Aaliyah said so refreshing is like, it's so easy to just frame them using the, the old false equivalents. Like if you approach a book banning story, you know, well, on this side, they're the people who want to ban the books. And then they're on this side, they're the people who don't want to ban the books. And what you're erasing is the fact that the people who want to ban the books are generally speaking a very small minority. And, and so the much smarter and more importantly, more responsible way to cover that story is to say, what's being banned? Uh, why is it being banned? And then to also look meaningfully behind, well, who exactly are these people pushing to have it banned? Why do their talking points look and sound like talking points we heard in a school district three states over, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, and, and, that, uh, and that also takes a lot of work. And mm -hmm. so I, I am super sympathetic, especially for local reporters who have you know, brutal deadlines and editors <laughs> who, who want them to file three stories yesterday. I get it, um, but man. I, I will say that um, I'm, I'm grateful that there are reporters like Aaliyah and, and some of my colleagues at Chalkbeat who have um, really been thoughtful about covering these issues. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of what's been written about some of these political battles are not being written by education journalists. Um, and so that's where so, there's so much noise. Um, and, um, and that's where it gets frustrating as for me as a journalist is um, hearing like, come on, how many stories do we have to see debunking the, you know, furries in, in the school, you know, like the, the litter boxes in schools? Like, I've seen, like, I feel like a half a dozen of those in just the last few weeks. Um, that's what's happening right now. Like, we're writing about stuff like that. Um, um, and and I, I just think that that too much of the reporting is being driven by, like, non-education journalists, and, and that's unfortunate because there's some really good work happening out there. And I, I, I'm going to take this moment and um, give a, to a an, an ad, but not a sponsored one. Um, I dropped in the link, Education Writers Association Day published a guide on covering LGBT students that was written by Beth Hawkins at the 74. Um, I just want to give a shout out to Caroline and the team at EWA for the countless resources they produce um, on covering this issue and, and countless other sensitive topics, um, all in the spirit of making education journalism stronger. So if you're not familiar with EW, highly encourage you to check them out um, and their national seminar, which is coming up in July. Um, Corey, we talked a little bit earlier about federal funding and the massive dollars flowing into schools. Um, would love to hear your take on the trends that you're seeing from the Department of Ed, the guidance, um, and then how folks, there's been a lot of coverage about how districts aren't spending the, the money. They have, there is a deadline to spend it. So let's, let's talk about that. I think this is where everyone in the audience now takes a nap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I, I, I only say half jokingly because like, 
uh, I have had this conversation with my editor many times over the last two years, like, have I done one story too many on school funding? Like, do people really care? Um, and I, I think part of the challenge of covering school funding, at least for me at the national level, is I don't think there are a lot of patterns. Um, there are a few obvious patterns. <laughs> All right, sorry, I was just laughing at Caroline who um, assured me that it, nobody's napping. Um, thank you, Caroline. Um, I, I, there are the obvious patterns. Like, obviously the federal guidelines require that a, a portion of this money be spent to mitigate learning loss, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and I have covered some of the other more interesting patterns like around um, using the money to hire counselors and nurses and social workers and school psychologists, folks who I, I wish had been in schools when I was a kid. You know, I don't think there can be too many social workers, counselors, school psychologists in a district. I, I think that's great. And that's a change that's been a long time coming. Um, I think a few things to watch are um, whether or not there is a is a spending cliff for hiring. I talked to a bunch of superintendents um, maybe six months ago who were all talking about, they were all saying the same thing and they were in lots of different districts. They're all saying, yes, I need to hire. Uh, I need to hire a couple different types of people. You know, maybe I need a second math teacher. I also want a counselor. I need a bus driver. Um, I need five paraeducators. Uh, and it was interesting, their approach though, several of them um, told me they were upfront telling these staffers, you're on a two-year contract or you're on a three-year contract. And beyond that, I make no promises. You know, just being upfront saying, <laughs> you're basically being paid for with federal dollars. But then I had a few other superintendents with a, with a, a bit more, open approach to it saying like, no, it's not a short-term contract. Yes, there may be a spending cliff, but they were also keeping tabs on sort of general attrition and retirement in the district. And they seemed pretty hopeful that, you know, they would lose enough people to basically absorb the new folks permanently. I think that's interesting. I think as we talked about earlier, patterns in, in inequity uh, are going to be really interesting. Although I, I got to be honest, I was just reading Genomics Lab earlier today, and I, I just don't know how we measure some of this academic stuff. I, re I, I really don't. Um, I don't know when we'll reach a point where we can say definitively, this is what the pandemic did, <laughs> um, and this is what we need to do about it. And that's just, I mean, obviously, that just means we have to work harder as journalists to 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 find the numbers to tell those stories. And in that sense, I, I, I really wish I were in Lori's shoes. I, I love the idea of having one community. As big as Detroit is, it is one community where you can, you can sort of get your hands around the spending at a micro level, around um, the impact it's having at a micro level in a way that nationally, I tell you, when I start to think about stuff like this, I just sort of curl up in a ball on the floor because I don't know where to start. Well, that was depressing. Sorry. <laughs> well, it doesn't look like we, we lost anyone. So I, I... Yay, you stayed. Are you they either asleep? fell asleep or they just forgot to exit. Um, <laughs> right. Early in the pandemic, our team did a, did a media analysis focused just on coverage of education technology and found a 70% increase between March 2019 and March 2020. Um, given that, you know, ed tech became a very important tool or a necessity for most, if not all districts during the transition to remote learning, but now as students are transitioning back into in-person instruction, do you, do you all see like ed tech continuing to be a story you know, there's been some coverage most recently, I think, in the Wall Street Journal about like the use of the ESSER dollars for different types of ed tech. Um, 
what what ed tech stories are you watching? What trends do you expect? Um, and we can start with uh, whoever wants to jump in. I think I saw Lori on mute. So I think she's she might have some ideas. Oh, I don't know that I have a whole lot of ideas. I think the thing that I'm I'm looking at is um, there there you know are are some parents who found that uh, virtual instruction worked best for their kids. Um, and, and that's what they prefer. And so I think, you know, obviously virtual instruction existed before the pandemic. Um, I think there will continue to be interest in it. The question for me is, is will the technology, will the curriculum, will the delivery of virtual instruction improve so that the students who are in virtual instruction are actually getting quality, quality education? Um, because we know what that year was like where you know most students a large number of students spent most of the year in you know remote um and it wasn't good you know for for the majority of the kids um so what what are what's being done to ensure that that the the experience that kids get in a virtual setting is comparable or equivalent to what they would get in person I'm, I'm old fashioned about this. I, I think education is based on the human connection. That's how we learn we're social creatures. And um, children learn when they have a strong and healthy connection to their educator. And I think the problem with remote learning is the tech became a thing itself and not the delivery system for the thing. And now the technology, the laptops, the Promethean boards, they're I think, I think there's a lot of opportunity for them to do what they can do well without being the education itself. I don't think they can be the education itself. Education requires people. And as long as the tech is allowed to help teachers and hopefully good teachers scaffold for their kids, maybe to help um, you know, differentiate in the classroom, you know, give, you know, divide the kids into different level groups as they're going and, and, and help meet kids where they are for five minutes here or 15 minutes there, whatever it may be. I think that is value added. Um, but I think we learned pretty quickly in the pandemic that remote learning was not good for most kids. And, and I, I don't see that changing. I just don't. Leah or Christina, anything to add there? Yeah, I, I, I can go. Um, I'm not gonna lie, you know, especially pre-pandemic, whenever I heard, you know, of an ed tech story, I was like, not it. <laughs> I've tended to avoid those stories just because it's kind of hard to cut through all the noise. Um, there's just so much money in that sector and honestly, a lot of aggressive PR. It's kind of a turnoff. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> but of course, you know, as, as the whiteboard analysis reflects, ed tech became an existential issue with, with the edu education with the pandemic and education with the pandemic. And it stopped becoming, in my mind, you know, as gimmicky as it used to feel. Um, moving forward, I think one uh, angle I'm really interested in is, is the role of ed tech in, in family engagement. You know, parents of all economic and racial and cultural backgrounds grew accustomed to having a front row seat to their kids' education with COVID. And, um, and even though children are now back in classrooms physically, the expectations for involvement remain high. And so, you know, I'm, I'm interested in how ed tech can reduce the barriers between uh, teachers, schools, and, and parents, particularly parents who don't speak English um, or who aren't very familiar with how schools work or, or simply don't have the time to be the PTA parent. Um, so that's, that's something I'm interested in. And I won't always tap myself out these days. <laughs> Yeah, I, I will say I, I certainly have shared that same feeling about ed tech stories. It is very hard to uh, cut through the noise. Um, I am frankly quite distrustful of the research that is often presented that says one ed tech product is better than another. I'm not so interested in ed tech as a thing. However, the equity issues that the lack of access to certain tech ex that the pandemic exposed those equity issues is quite interesting to me at least. Um, 
And this will give me a chance to kind of like shout out one of my colleagues story. Um, uh, my colleague Javeria just did a story about how Oakland used sort of the pandemic as a chance to really reduce the, the gap between the haves and have nots in terms of like who has access to the computers and who has access to inter in the internet. That is interesting. Like whether they use this Chromebook or that Chromebook or whatever, you know, that that is, you know, there is, um, you know, the reality is, I and I agree completely with Corey about like, you know, the human touch aspect of education. However, we had kids who weren't even getting like a little bit of that. Um, and so we need to follow that piece. I don't think that there were a lot of education reporters who got like, at least I didn't see, who got like really hung up in trying to debate one product or another. This is where I did see, I, I felt that I saw some really strong reporting on like, oh my gosh, you know, there's kids who are camped outside of the McDonald's because they don't have access to their teacher. Or, you know, there are teachers <laughs> who are camped outside of McDonald's because they don't have access to the internet at their home to teach their classes. You know, those are some pretty powerful stories. Um, you know, and I, and I, you know, I, I must say they will still be followed because our geography is still the same. I remember talking with the superintendent who, um, uh, many of his students were on um, reservation and, and just literally they couldn't get internet very well because of, of, of mountains. <laughs> and that's going to that's gonna still be an issue. Um, and that's that's something that no one individual school district can solve. And so I see that as, as um, you know, a continuing story. I'm going to an issue more stories about like the recent different ed tech tools. Similar, I recently, Lori, one of your colleagues at Chalkbeat, I believe out of New York, wrote a piece questioning the research behind a reading curriculum that was very popular in New York City schools. Um, I've talked to a few organizations like ISTE and the EdTech Evidence Exchange that are working to equip districts with the tools to understand what, what ed tech works and what research is behind it and how to evaluate that research. So. I, I would expect we'll see more of that um, pop up. And I think districts are increasingly um, more skeptical consumers um, and are looking for that research basis, particularly with like the S or evidence requirements. Um, I have one more question before we move to audience Q&A. So if any, any of our audience have questions about, uh, for the panelists, drop them in the Q&A or the chat. Um, but I just wanna, go around once more. Um, what's the one education story you think is being overshadowed right now? And are there data or sources that you're looking for to help you tell that story? Uh, maybe someone on the on the call can help out. Um, but we'll start. I started with Lori earlier when I did this. We'll start with Aaliyah this time and, and go around. Um, yeah, so, so I'm biased because I'm working on a big project um, about this right now. But I think one story that's overshadowed is, is that about how the youngest children are faring and preparing for their transition into the, the school system. Um, much of the, the early learning coverage uh, these days, including some of mine, you know, has, has focused on the very important issue of, of child care access and, and the child care workforce crisis. We hear a lot about how stressed parents, um, stressed and demoralized really parents are, uh, of young children are, and, and that's an incredibly important story um, the economic uh, impact alone is real and it's scary and it's not going away. Um, but I'm very curious about the impact um, that's having on, on children's outcomes. You know, we know the, the first few years of life are, are arguably the most formative. So what are the, the consequences of spending most, if not all of those years in an unprecedented, chaotic, disrupted, isolated, traumatic, stressful time, AKA the pandemic? Um, I know yeah, it'll be years before before we know the answers, if, if we ever figure them out for sure, but I'm, I'm eager for uh, data comparing, for example, the, the kindergarten readiness of, of today's four-year-olds compared with that of their pre-pandemic predecessors. Beyond, um, beyond academics, I'm, I'm looking for data comparing you know, social emotional measures. So a lot of the data on kids' development that I've seen um, is, is parent reported. That's important data, but it's obviously subjective. So, so eager for, for, you know, the more empirical data I can get for this project, the better. So, so just a plug for that. Corey? 
so this may sound a little strange, but I honestly, one of the things I, I want to focus on in the coming year, and I've talked to my editor about it, is um, I want to I want to do some joyful stories. <laughs> Uh, I've, I have been beaten down uh, and I feel like the general public has too. And I, I feel like there is a lot of joy out there that we're not paying attention to. And the resumption of schedules, going back to schools, getting back with friends. It, it, obviously there's still lots of turmoil and lots of awfulness. Um, but I, I worry worry a bit, and maybe this is just the NPR in me. And, and keep in mind that I do radio as well as print for my stories. And, and there, there's a certain, certain, a certain kind of joyfulness that you can capture on the radio that is, is hard to replicate in print. Um, but I just wanna find it. I wanna find the playfulness. I wanna spend time with kids this summer. I wanna ask them silly questions. Um, and I don't want to talk about COVID and I don't want to talk about things lost. And that may sound cheap or silly, but I just, I really feel it. I mean, part of this as a dad, um, but part of it, it I, I'm just tired. And I want, I, I feel like part of our job as journalists too is, is, is to tell the good as well as the bad, to uplift, right? So I, I, just, I can't wait. <laughs> Christina? Yeah, I think that like in, in that same vein, I feel like what is being undercovered are things that are happening inside classrooms between teachers and students. I think that, I mean, all of us have been education reporters long enough that if I said like common core reporting, you, we would all be like, oh my God. But at least that was a conversation about curricula, right? That was a conversation about like, how are we going to teach kids? Right now, every story is about schools, like about CRT or about libraries or the books or stuff like that. But there are just like, it, it is overshadowing like stories about like, how is this teacher teaching this thing? Um, and how are kids responding to this thing that is being taught? Um, you know, I look back on like, you know, the stories about like um, the, the reading, you know, Emily Hanford's work and reading and like, boy, those are the good old days. And we just need to talk about like how to teach kids how to read. These are still stories that are being done, of course. But I mean, I'm just saying that like, I would love to have a chance to go back <laughs> to some of those things, which are quite important, um, but they get overshadowed by very noisy stuff that is also important, but is also very noisy. Um, yeah, those are those are the stories that I that I would love to see. So, like to the extent that anybody's listening who can like help people get inside schools, that's the way those stories get told. Is when reporters can get inside schools. So, and and Lori to wrap us up um, and then we'll move to audience Q&A. Um, I just wanna echo everything that everyone said, including uh, uh, Corey's uh, a comment about uh, joy. I think an editor at Chalkbeat at a, at a meeting a while ago said, where's the joy? Um, and it's hard, you know, because like, I think we've all been kind of in triage mode for, for so many years. Um, so a couple of things that I wanted to mention. One, there, there, there have been a lot of stories about tutoring, um, about um, online tutoring, about um, just like best practices in tutoring, but I haven't seen a whole lot of, 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 of looking into who's, who's getting tutoring and who's not getting tutoring are the kids who need it the most getting tutoring. Um, you know, we've heard stories of schools where um, the, the kids who get tutoring often, well, the, the kids who need it the most may not be getting it for various reasons. One of them being transportation because it's only offer, offered after school. So it's an equity issue to me. And I think that, you know, that's not something that, that we've been sort of focused on. Um, I also think that, you know, looking beyond, you know, the, the COVID recovery money, when that money runs out, we, the, the issues, the academic, the emotional issues will um, persist. And I, we're not talking a lot about like, how do, we, how do we keep the recovery effort going when this money runs out? Um, 
and we hit this funding cliff. Oh, thank you for that, uh, for all of your responses. Um, so looking at questions from the audience, um, we have a question from Lisa um, asking about how how we should cover parent agency in education and how do you how do uh, can reporters present the idea that parents have a right to be involved without signing off on the curriculum or the books that are in the library um so i don't know if anyone has thoughts on that or if it's come up in your reporting um well, we can always follow up on that no, one. No, I, I don't want to ignore it because I think it's a great question. Uh, I, I just don't have a good answer. I think um, it, we're at a fascinating intersection right now where you have some parents trying to exercise a lot of control over schools' autonomy or what has traditionally been a lot of autonomy. You know, schools have been allowed to do what schools do, just like we wouldn't show up at the firehouse one day until the firefighters had to do their jobs. Um, uh, but I, but I, I don't know where the, as reporters, like, I don't know how to be the arbiter for, you know, you're overstepping parent group A and you're not, uh, I, I, I don't know, except I, the line I've been drawing in my head and my heart over the last few months is when what you're asking of your school is actually hurting children, other people's children. and. And I, you know, that's, that's my thinking. But then I, I haven't done nearly as many of these stories as probably all of the other panelists here. So um, I should shut up. Um, well, so I, I'm gonna merge a few questions together for this next one, um, because we had a few about data and, and what, what data sources are your go-to data sources for information? Which ones do you wish you had? And then how do you determine whether like data is reliable and something you should use in your reporting? So I wish we had all the data sources. <laughs> all the data. I mean, I mean there's no data. It's difficult, you know, I think this is a challenging question because I think it's different, you know, you, you use different data sources depending on what it is that you're, what you're writing about. I mean, I, but I would like them all, <laughs> um, you know, it's, um, it, you know, and, it, it, you know, one, one thing about like, you know, I've, I've certainly become more adept at getting them now sitting here on my computer, like, you know, minority report just like <laughs> pulling things across if anybody's seen that movie but you know I I know where things can be found now but um you know nothing that doesn't beat like you know getting a person to illustrate a story you know the data can only tell you so much um yeah I'll all say right I see a minority report fan in the, in the audience um, I'll, I'll just say there, there isn't any one like go to data source for me. I mean, I think like Christina said, like there's a ton of, of, of education data and it's different from state to state. What I wish for is that the data um, or the information related to how schools are spending or planning to spend their COVID relief money was a little more accessible yeah. and a little more um, consistent um, so that we could really provide our readers with a, um, uh, a, a, a good look at how schools are actually spending the money, but it, it's been difficult. Um, we are finding ways to analyze the data, but it's been really difficult. And I think it could have been, it, it didn't have to be this way, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, so yeah, that's my thought. Yeah, I think, I mean, throughout the pandemic, the, the data sources, the quality of the data that we've been able to rely on as education journalists has been pretty abysmal. Um, you know, I think, you know, from data on school closures to spending, I mean, part of it I think is, is just a, a side effect of, of how decentralized our education system is, but, but as a national reporter, I mean, it's, it's all but impossible to get apples to apples comparisons, whether, you're, you know, regardless of what you're writing about. So I just wish it were more streamlined 
and easier to, to compare and contrast. Um, we were talking about how hard it is to, to, to track down or figure out who those missing students were. I already did a big project and we, I couldn't even figure out like very basic attendance data at, at the largest school districts. I mean, it's, it's, it's been frustrating, but you know, in some ways that is the story. So my, my big attendance project ended up being a story about how bad the data was. <laughs> I mean, that's a little bit worrisome, though, because I think about like, I mean, and not saying anything bad about any of these organizations, but like, you know, there's been a lot of stories that have been relied on by data, by people who are just sort of like ad hoc collecting data. And which is like, you know, the Center for Reinventing Public Education, like bless you guys, um, you know, Burbio or Zern or, you know, just a lot of just different organizations just kind of like collecting data and pushing it out there, which I'm not saying there's anything wrong with their data, but it's just like, you know, sure would be nice if like the people who were like pushing out all this money were collecting that data too, um, as opposed to like, different groups with different methodologies and different abilities to track and et cetera. Um, you know, it just, it just makes you have to, I think, qualify your stories a lot um, when you're writing them about like, where did this data come from? And are we talking about most school districts or just a slice of them and, you know, all of those things. And also like this pandemic has taught me to be deeply skeptical of, of most data. Like, Oh, we're going to talk about test scores for kids. Okay, so were the tests taken at school or were they taken at home? Were they taken, um, how many kids in the district actually showed up that day? Who are the kids least likely to show up that day? Like, there are just so many ways to undermine even basic data. And also, like, for me, Christina, you mentioned Verbio. I love this. I, I was boggled the first, like, six months of the pandemic. Like, we were all just, I feel like Verbio was in the first graph of every, every other story I wrote and every other story that every other reporter wrote. And it's like, it's Burbio. <laughs> so for everyone out there who talks about government schools, government run schools, you know, the government needs to get out of our schools. Like our data would not be this bad. <laughs> if, if there was any connective tissue whatsoever between one school district and the next, like our schools are truly disparate. Mm -hmm. And that's why the data is so bad. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but we have to call it what it is. And, and as reporters, we have an obligation when we do see shiny new data, to just be kind of clear eyed about it. Like, you know what? It's probably gonna be just as crappy as the old shiny new data because Districts don't talk to each other and they measure kids in different ways, right? Like you could even give kids, you could call it, you know, end of year testing. It's a different test. <laughs> it's, you know, it's just different. So don't, don't try to draw sweeping conclusions because we as journalists love sweeping conclusions. Um, well, we can't do it. <laughs> Well, we are a few minutes over and I, I don't want to keep folks from their next meeting, um, but thank you to our panelists for joining us. It was a pleasure having you and getting to hear more about what you're covering, how things have changed over the past year, and thank you to everyone who attended. Um, we'll be sending out um, an email with a link to the recording um, to everyone who registered and also some of the, the links and everything that were shared in the chat so that you have them. Um, thank you uh, so much. Thank you to my fellow panelists too. Yeah, thank, thank you, you everyone. Keep Great. doing the good work, y'all. You too. Bye.